This began again. Uh, we were at the uh, tab J here, uh, multi-phase systems, heat transfer, and chemical reactors. <clears throat> and just run down some things. Uh, in mixing, the most common process objective is the creation of contact area. Right, and area is a mechanical process. You should recognize that it's a mechanical process. Why don't we go to the slideshow and use my pointer stuff and see what I can do here. Let's see, color. First off, we go with a highlighter. Then we go for color. Let's try red. Okay, we're loaded. Okay, area is a mechanical process, generation of area. Not all multi-phase reaction problems are due to poor mixing. Not all, but a lot of them are. And energy per time or power is needed to create contacting area, basically. Now, the problem with solids, well, one of the issues is solid suspension in the area of mixing. Now, whenever you deal with solids, you got to recognize a couple of things. Uh, solids is a problem phase, basically. Liquids uh, are fairly simple. Gases are very simple. And you find them taught in universities. You know, they can talk to you about the kinetic theory of gases, talk to you a little bit about fluid mechanics. Solids, however, uh, tends to be diverse in processes. There are major differences in solids, much more variations than in gas and liquids. So whenever you have solids and you add in liquids, you're going to have a difficult, you may have difficulties. And you should recognize if you indeed have a solids and liquids in your processing, you also have gases as well. So there's two broad categories here, uh, simple solids and complex solids. Complex solids is uh, important in agglomeration, all right, or appears, the, the complexity of solids appear in such processing as agglomeration. Anyway. Simple solids are affected by particle size, basically density, void fraction, and particle size distribution. Now, the suspension of sand would be an example of a simple solid in a mixing area. Simple solids follow the Zeiderine correlation. Now, this was way back in 1958. So, the Zeiderine correlation has been tested and confirmed many times. You'll see some of it just some of it soon. Uh, suspension is easy to accomplish. Suspension is very similar to blending. Solids and uh, solids behave much like a liquid. So you have the process objectives. Now each one of these would require a different design, right? So you have designs for off-bottom suspension. You have designs for complete homogeneity. You have the reverse, you want to submerge solids, or you maintain or want to maintain suspension. The reasons why you want those, well, off-bottom suspension, you expose surface area for transport. Complete homogeneity, you eliminate effects of particle size distribution. Again, solid, sub solid submergence may be exposing area. Again, maintaining suspension can be very important as well. In that, uh, if the solids lose suspension, they may re sit on the bottom. And one of the problems with solids is they agglomerate. If they sit on the bottom and they have solid solid reactions or start to agglomerate, then you ha will have a difficulty in getting them resuspended. So, a very important point is don't lose suspension in some of these applications. So, uh, off-bottom suspension, uh, design of design is objective in simple solids. Off-bottom suspension, complete off-bottom suspension. Surface area is available for, for processing. Surface area is, is not available for processing if not suspended. So you're interested in uh, bottom geometry that are helpful. It's basically off-bottom suspension is a bottom process. You have to worry about that. 
Now, uh, in solids area, the general area, you always really want to check for particle size. That's the most important effect. Then you really need to check, however, people often forget about solids concentration. You need to think about what's the concentration of solids. I have a, a children's cereal, children's cereal, box of Cheerios. You all can tell me how big a Cheerio is, but you can't tell me the number of Cheerios in the box. So oftentimes people talk about particle size and they completely ignore particle concentration, and it's an important variable to be considered. Also, uh, you have uh, variations in concentration due to variations in particle size, and, and the whole area becomes very, can be very complicated, maybe not difficult, but certainly complicated and complex. Right. Small particles will go th throughout the tank will basically go throughout the tank. Uh, larger particles will likely sit, sit close to the bottom. Or So the other one that needs to be uh, some attention to is the idea of uh, surface freshness. How fresh is your surface? Now, if you have a catalyst and you have a catalyst reaction, your catalyst is going to become poisoned over time, most likely. And it's all, uh, you need to replenish the catalyst, or you could possibly have a grinder inside your reactor. So you have all the tra uh, you have all the design for solid suspension, and then you throw in a grinding disc to obtain fresh surface freshness, right? So oftentimes you're trying to do, in scale-up, oftentimes you're trying to do two or three objectives. Here you want good uh, suspension of solids and also have fresh surface of the solids. And anyway, so if we, uh, if we go back here, uh, usually you have this. This is all you get, but these other things can be quite important, can be significant, and should be established. Impeller input is usually a single phase. Low void fractions have no effect on power. Uh, mixing intensity may affect particle size. In other words, high rotational speeds, you may break apart your particles. Uh, may not be uh, as intuitive these effects may not be as intuitive as you would expect. Particle attrition is very common. Particles collide with the impeller, tank walls, and other particles. And oftentimes, one of the objectives is prevention of, of excessive fines, or opposite to that, prevention of a particle agglomeration. So you're looking for prevention of excessive fines, and trying to prevent a particle agglomeration. Excessive fines will be produced uh, because the impeller is uh, could be considered a uh, hammer mill, basically, a grinder. So you be, should be uh, aware of that possibility. You can also have small particles accumulate on the surface of bubbles and other charged surfaces. Particles can be chemically, uh, physically poisoned or coated. Surface films can influence process revol results. Bottom baffles are not recommended. There's a paper out there by the Japanese that said or recommended you have a tank bottom here and they recommended a bottom baffle. And if I look down on this, it might be like, like a baffle crossed here and a baffle crossed here. And it affected the flow field at the bottom of the tank. And they were singing praises about bottom baffles. I tried the same thing in my lab and got completely uh, turned off. Or I should say the uh, bottom baffles did not work well at all. So here, here you have a circumstance where somebody supports bottom baffles and some people uh, have found just the opposite to be true. Now, 
what you have to realize is that with an axial flow impeller, a pitch plate turbine like here, right, you have a dead zone here, right in here. That would be a dead zone right here. And uh, the flow field will go around. The best way of taking care of a dead zone is I would first off have an impeller on the tank bottom. That's the first option you have. Next option is um, you fill in this volume uh, with contouring, right? So the bottom of your tank may look like this, right? And the impeller will be sitting up here like that. And uh, then there isn't this dead zone. Three ways of handling dead zone is put an impeller in it, have a feed stream go through it, or basically fill it in. So settled solids is a major problem in industry. It's not a simple matter. It permits solid-solid reactions from occurring, i.e. agglomeration. Resuspension may be a problem. And solid solid reactions may cause bo strong bonding, strong body bonding. Startup torque could be substantially higher. One design I found uh, was essentially a shaft mounted bulldozer, basically. It was a big old tank, it's a fairly big tank, and at the very bottom they had put in an I beam. I don't know if you realize an I beam. But an I-beam is, it went far, uh, all the way across the tank, right, and fill, uh, and, uh, if solids were going to, uh, if there was going to be solid-solid contacting there, that uh, is huge, huge pipe diameter, too, I should say. It's a foot diameter uh, shaft. Uh, empty, uh, it was an empty uh, pipe. It was a pipe, not a solid metal. Uh, and uh, this material was going to move the solids on the tank bottom, or it would probably uh, wrench or twist the entire tank. If it wasn't going to move the solids, it was going to twist the entire tank. That's tough. That's a tough design. The famous clear layer. Probably you may or may not know about the clear layer. Happens in turbulent flow, happens all the time. Difficulty in filling slurries in bottles, if you're filling slurries. You really don't have to put up with it. And change in geometry uh, can approach complete homogeneity if the quick design happens, right? So let's see what we have here. Uh, let's see what the next slide is. Oop. Let's go over here. The famous clear layer is shown here. Um, the Z is this height here, and the T is this diameter here. And so you have the standard geometry sitting here, standard geometry sitting here. And the solids will only go up so far, and this will be clear. And this is the modified Froud number. This is actually coming from Zeiterin's correlation in 1958. You have the impeller, impeller stuff up in the numerator here, it's, uh, rotational speed diameter squared, versus the density difference between the liquid and the solid, the particle size and gravity. Now, there is a, some sort of mean particle size. And then you have the diameter of the impel, uh, tank, excuse me, diameter of the particle over the diameter of the impeller. Diameter of the impeller is right here. This is D sitting here. Now then, this was uh, back in 1985. Uh, some chaps at Shell Oil Company did this work, uh, Shell Royal Shell, in the Netherlands. Now, this will probably be cast into the engineering literature. And they also make a big point that it only goes to 0.95, okay? Due to the circumstances they were running at, they felt that uh, they weren't going to get to one. 
I'll show you. You can get the one. Uh, my experience on this sort of thing uh, went out way past 30 or 10, 30, and way up there, a couple hundred, actually, a modified frown number. And there was, uh, how can I say it, no upper limit. Anyway, this show this phenomena to you in case uh, you, you really don't appreciate this. So we'll go to this. And we'll go uh, to our computer here, and we'll go to our videos and presentations. And what I want to show you is, uh-oh, did I lose? There we are. Let's see if we can run this. Video, okay. There is the famous clear layer, okay? So, this is a, from a lawsuit. I can't really tell you about the lawsuit involved, okay? Only it was like a two-year affair and it was ongoing and uh, the companies involved, I can't really talk about the companies involved, okay? Either, but this is a slurry uh, feed tank and it's very poorly mixed. Uh, there's a clear layer up here, clear, relatively clear. And down at the bottom, there are sanded in regions where it's not fully suspended. Okay. So I, I don't know if you can detect that or not. You can see some solids being lifted off the tank bottom. Now then, they go and change the geometry on this thing. And remember, I've been preaching changing the geometry. And when they change the geometry, suddenly they get really good performance. Or not suddenly, they change geometry and uh, got really excellent performance. And what performance did they get? 60% solids. It was a 230 horsepower. They had up pumping and down pumping. Yeah, this is a proposed retrofit or a retrofit. If you notice that you have the clear layer formed when only you had this impeller. The clear layer formed when only you had this impeller. Now then, they added a second impeller at the top, and the clear layer essentially disappeared. You had tank performance. Let's see if we can see this. So what they did, they had one impeller and then they went to two impellers. And the trick is they pump upward. Excuse me. The bottom impeller pumps down and the upper impeller pumps up. And you can see good surface action there. No clear layer. Clear layer is all gone. You don't have to tolerate a clear layer. layer. Good solid suspension here. So we'll just go back here for a second. I want to make sure you understand what's going on. With this situation, suppose you had a very large tank and you have a filling operation. You're filling bottles with this slurry. And everything goes well until this clear layer just starts going into the bottles. <laughs> So what happens is your product, while filling, uh, has got one concentration, and suddenly it switches to another concentration up here. So I've seen this. Uh, uh, one of my episode, uh, one of my uh, consulting trips there, I've seen this in uh, on a filling line happen. So. Another way of perhaps solving this problem in a much more easier way, if you can do it, is to bubble gas through here. Instead of having a second impeller, which may be difficult, you bubble gas through it. So you got a poorly mixed system, and suddenly you have a very well mixed system, right? And that's basically, there's the clear layer from the top, right? Now you go with the design improvement. You have good good mixing everywhere. 
So I'll just stop this and go back to our PowerPoint. So let's, uh, let's go back to my side show. Okay. So this was back in 1985, right? Go my Well, I'll, I'll just leave it like this. Okay. Uh oh. Anyway. So what they did, and uh, they they used this design, and then they added a nether impeller right up here. Right, and they went this way. So what would happen is the solids would be pumped up to this location, or up here by this impeller, and then further pumped up here like that with this impeller. So then the result is they'd have complete homogeneity throughout the entire tank. They would have excellent mixing. Now, this data here is for the single impeller. And for the second impeller being added, an up pumping, you have the down pumping, and then you have the up pumping. What would happen to this data, it would probably look like this. The data would probably be in this range. In other words, you would first off go all the way to the one, all right? Go all the way to the one. And you would do it at a lower, certainly a much lower modified fraud number. And that means lower fraud number, lower speeds involved. So again, Throughout this course, I've been emphasizing uh, mixing, uh, excuse me, changing in geometry. So you have this geometry sitting here, right? Then you're adding this as an improvement or a retrofit. And uh, problem solved. It took them a while. It took them about two years to do this. Lawsuit was dropped. And... Uh, that's a good thing, I guess. And the uh, slurry uh, feed stream uh, was maintained at a constant was maintained at a constant concentration solids. Okay, so complete homogeneity. Complete homogeneity is usually not needed for most processes. However, some processes. You would like to have complete homogeneity, such as in paints, radioactive sludge in glass, and in making drugs. Now, the idea in drugs is you you got to recognize that the drug, the reaction kinetics for drugs is quite uh, sensitive. So you have the standard geometry here, and what happens is you have a clear layer up here, so the solids only go up this far. So you have a clear layer here. You then have essentially two different reactors here. You have a clear layer reactor and another reactor down here. And the kinetics can be such that it's quite sensitive. And as a result, the impurities, the impurity profiles, the impurity profiles, mind you, change with the behavior of this uh, clear layer. Now, with this geometry, you're going to get smart, and you're going to add in the second impeller, and then you're going to have solids everywhere throughout the entire tank. Everything is seen in every sort of type of environment. There isn't any stratification occurring, and then the purity profiles for your drug manufacturing will turn out to be uh, constant. Drug companies scale up often on impurity profiles rather than what you might think of impure, uh, purity profiles. They scale up on impurity profiles rather than purity profiles. They may actually do both, who knows. But the idea is uh, bad performance corrected by changing geometry to good performance. Now, in the olden days, complete homogeneity may have required 10 times power. 
four, four to ten times power input. But the change in geometry, this power draw, this the power consumed here can be very close to the power consumed here. This diameter impeller can be smaller than this one. As a result, this is the major power input impeller. The other impellers could be just there with a modest increase in power. So, complete homogeneity, down pumping at the bottom, up pumping at the top. The impeller lifts the solids off the bottom and the other impeller carries it to the top. Contouring the tank may also help. I already talked about that. Mm -hmm. Baffles, also interesting. Uh, often the, the baffles can be looking like uh, this here. All right. And you catch solids in this space in here, and it could become a cleaning issue. Whereas if you go into contacting, perhaps you go with dimple baffles. Now, typically in large tanks, you probably can't do that. But uh, in drums, small drums, 50-gallon drums, you can have indented uh, baffles in there. Where there is no place for the solids to catch, to be collected. Contouring can be quite helpful and prevent cleaning or minimize cleaning issues and improve overall behavior or performance. You should always consider gas lances and blowbacks, uh, trap solids. Okay. What uh, has happened in the past is you have your tank, you have what is called the killer, right? We didn't tell you about the killer. And everybody pretty much has this design. The impeller, uh, I mean, the control valve is down here. Okay. So you have the impeller sitting here, whatever. And due to the fact that there's a volume here, solids will collect here, right? And if they collect there, the solids can agglomerate in there. And you uh, can form a plug. Now, a story, a bad story, uh, awful situation. Uh, these uh, operators, they were running a uh, premix tank for a polymer reactor. And uh, the premix tank, they first they added the monomer and then they were adding the initiator, they realized that they didn't have enough initiator. So they had to more, order more initiator. Now then, the reactor sat there, small reactor, is a small, small device. Over Christmas break, uh, Christmas holidays, and sat there with a little bit of initiator and monomer, and what happened was that it formed a nice big, plug right here. So uh, they didn't follow a procedure. The procedure said to, if they didn't complete the uh, procedure, they should drum off, drum off the contents of the tank, premix tank, drum it off. Unfortunately, uh, they, got, they got to thinking. They said, uh, there's no difference between a drum and this premix tank. What's the difference? We just leave it in there over Christmas time. And they didn't follow procedure. And they drummed off, they did not drum off the uh, the uh, contents, and you formed this plug. So they come back, they add more initiator, right? So they're already, they're, they've got enough monomer in there, and they got enough initiator, and it's all well mixed up now, and they try to push it into the reactor, okay? And unfortunately, there's a plug there now. <laughs> so the re the premix tank had a name. It's called premix tank. When the plug forms here, the name is changed. The name changes. It's now called a bomb. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all the other thing you can say for that. Uh, a bomb. That was 10.30 in the morning when they figured out they couldn't push the contents of the premix tank into the reactor. 
12.30, excuse me, 11.30 p.m. that evening, the new shift came on, and they sent a chap up here, and uh chap started beating on this bomb, and he got the reaction to go. The reaction is not supposed to go in the premix tank. The reaction is supposed to go in the reactor in this premix tank. Uh, basically, it was probably very similar to a molten uh, volcano exploding. It had a uh, manhole cover, and there are a lot of bolts on that manhole cover, and maybe 50 bolts. And that manhole cover blew. And then they had the a little, what do you call those things, pressure relief with the little uh, uh, pressure. Uh, <laughs> so they were spewing plastic out of here, hot molten plastic, and it was shooting plastic out the top up here. It was all a very bad scene. It's sort of like one of those science fiction disaster type movies with strange lighting in the background, I'm sure. So... Um, we could talk about procedures all we want to, but uh, you know, of course, there's four levels to a procedure. First, you got to tell them what to do. Second, you got to tell them why they're doing it that way. Third, re third is what happens if they don't do it that way, all right? And the fourth level of a procedure should be uh, previous accidents. Okay, let me go over those one more time. Procedure should list what to be done, what is good to be done. This uh, will tell you what will happen if it hasn't been done, if you don't do it that way. This one is uh, perhaps the accidents, or actually the second one should be explaining why you want to do it that way. The third one has the accidents and for, uh, possible accidents that would come from not following the procedure. And the fourth would be examples of disasters. Again, what you're going to do, why you're doing it that way, what happens if you don't do it that way, and accidents. So you have one. Now, the rest of these three, uh, two, three, and four are typically not found, right? They're typically not included. So. Procedures in industry, uh, how can I put it? Not so hot, N not hot at all. It's extreme weakness in our in our profession that we don't pay. A One of the objectives of piloting people is to write the proper procedures. By the way, that's one of the one of the reasons why you scale up procedures. And what happens is, in this particular example down here. Right where there was a plug formed and a solid suspend, whatever. Anyway, uh, there was time added to, to, to the procedure. There was time added to the procedure. And that should be a safety violation. Anytime where you have a procedure, there should be a specification of time between the two steps. How long do you have? How long do you have? There are so many uh, industrial accidents that can, will, will happen because people added time to the procedure or took away time in the procedure. Another example, again, I really can't tell you names, right? Uh, this chap was making a throat lozenge, right? And he had a kettle, okay? And he's been doing this procedure for two years and his method is he adds alcohol, and then he adds the sugar stuff, adds sugar, and uh, proceeds to continue on with his procedure. Anyway, one morning he comes in, um, adds the alcohol, looks at his watch and says, oh, time for a coffee break. So he goes for the coffee break. He comes back 15 minutes later and for some reason, he caused a spark to occur, and the room was saturated with alcohol. It flashed, and he was in there in a, in a burning, burning 
air, essentially, is breathing that in. He died. Anyway, all my stories are an awful lot of my stories. People die in the end. <laughs> you really, you really want to be careful about things. Things are not always what they seem to be. Okay. Take this clear layer, which I just told you about. A lot of you have never even heard of that. All right. Slurries often have a clear layer at their surface forms because of limited energy flow to the surface. Major problem in many processes. Increasing the solids content increases slurry viscosity. You may go back uh, from uh, something that's low viscosity. As I increase solids, I go to high viscosity. So I go from turbulent flow into tur laminar flow and here it is. If the process was turbulent, the process may be, let's get rid of some of this stuff here. If the process was turbulent, the process may be in transition because of the increase in viscosity. Because <laughs> uh, the increase in viscosity puts you in the transition regime. You go from something that's easy to mix, 40 revolutions to mix. Now, if you have an excellent geometry, you go into a region where you Poorly mixed, 300 revolutions to mix. I ran across this, another wood trip here. The company was in Vermont, right? Again, I won't tell you the company. Great company, liked them a lot. They treated me well. Anyway, uh, see, the n theta value, we really never really talked about it. It may be in the notes later on. The n theta value to mix versus the Reynolds number, and we have the Reynolds number down here. It comes along like this, and for a helical ribbon, there's a bump, and it drops back down. So for the helical ribbon, it's, four, it's 60, and then it drops to 40, and up here is 300. Now then, however, right, for uh, turbulent mixers, it looks something like, oh, got the same color, it looks something like that. Let me do that again with another color. Uh-oh. Sorry. What happens is the N theta, that's not a pretty color. N theta versus Reynolds number for a turbulent mixer looks like this. Right? It doesn't mix at all. And this may be sitting around a Reynolds number of 1,000. So... Here I have very good mixing with being more or less turbulent. Then I enter in the transition regime, and this thing goes through the roof. It may never mix, right? So what I was dealing with with this particular company, it was in Vermont. Vermont. Okay, it's kind of really interesting what, what we found or what I found. I don't think they believed what I found, but that's okay. Uh, Vermont. They, in the wintertime, they heat the building, right? It makes sense. So they heat the building, so their Reynolds number for this material is sitting over here. And their storage rooms may be 80 degrees Fahrenheit, reasonable temperature, maybe 75. So they were running along, no problem. Their end theta values were 30 or 50 or whatever. However, in the winter time, excuse me, in the summertime, they turned on the air conditioner. And the air conditioner was at 65, made the storage room at 65 degrees. Now then, you got to recognize the Reynolds number has viscosity in the denominator. This is a symbol for viscosity. So at 65 degrees, the viscosity went up very high. So they went right down in this regime. They were on the verge of failure in the, in the wintertime. It was okay because they didn't fail. Summertime, they turned on the air conditioner for the building. The air conditioner cooled down the whole building, including the storage room, <clears throat> which their feed was in the storage room, which changed the viscosity, lowered the Reynolds number, and, and their end theta value went through the roof. So in the wintertime, they were doing great. In the summertime, just because they turn on the air conditioner, they had uh, process failure. 
It's pretty cool. Uh, just just casually turning on the air conditioner on your on your feed stream. Uh, uh, Story in a room with air conditioning, and voila, bad things happen. Transition regime is a problem regime. Processes in the transition regime, you add more solids, you may be in the laminar regime. Now, what's nice about the laminar regime, there's no settling. Once you got the solids in, then they won't probably come out, right? Mm -hmm. You've seen air bubbles in amber, right? Air bubbles in amber. And that the air bubble's been in there for a couple thousand years, and it still hasn't come out yet. So, differences in heterogeneity can cause, affect mass transfer, affect product distribution, selectivity for ra reacting systems with complex kinetics. Solution is design complete homogeneity, which limits the effect of poor mixing. My goal is to eliminate poor mixing, right? That's the objective here. I don't want poor mixing. By the way, you're going to have to go up. In this business, you're going to have to fight battles with other people that think they know everything. You're sitting here thinking you know everything, and you go up and fight somebody who thinks they know everything, and you don't agree. This happens all the time, right? So you have, you have to resolve that conflict. It's a very interesting conflict. Right. I haven't found anybody that. Uh, never mind. I won't say that. I haven't found anybody always right. Right. Anyway, solid submergence. Well, another processing problem. Wetting so particles is wrong or bad. Particles come with air. Particles come with air. You might try this situation. You unbaffle the top portion of the tank, spin up the, and form a center vortex, and you want to add the powder right here so it hits the impeller quite, quite dramatically. And that would be a good way of make, uh, adding powder to a liquid if you don't want to go the easier way of falling liquid curtains. But falling liquid curtains is much better. Now, here's another story for you. I hate to <laughs> this particular company, very, very famous company, uh, people, they were adding bricks, bricks, not powder. They were adding bricks to this liquid. They had this system. They were adding bricks. And they kept on, they kept on wondering why the impeller was bent. <laughs> <laughs> right when they were kept on adding the bricks, they eventually bent their impeller, and they were wondering why they were bending their impeller. What had happened? Another example: of this situation. This is a pharma uh, company down in South Carolina, I think. Anyway, they had a screw figure, uh, screw fe feeder here, and they they oversized the screw feeder, right? And they were screw feeding powder. Okay. And so what happened is they, over time, they eventually formed a huge sand, sand dune in there. And every time the impeller would pass that sand dune, they'd take a whack at it. And I thought that was quite, quite interesting. They, they were running the screw feeder in such a manner that uh, the impeller cannot keep up with it. This is very this is sort of very bad design. Obviously the powder goes in one place, goes right to the bottom. What you want to do is have a spreader, right? When you add fertilizer to your your lawn, right, or fertilizer out in the fields, you want an even distribution of solids across the top, uh, across the surface. You want to spread the fertilizer so there's no hot spots. You don't want to do this type of thing. So it's amazing uh, all the different stories that you can develop on the solid suspension from industry. Anyway, it's not uncommon to submerge solids. You also submerge gas, substantial portions of gas that goes in. You can have the particles classify on you. You can start forming floating agglomerates, clinkers for sure. 
in one case you had the impeller here you had the liquid surface here and right around here was a solid uh, donut of solids in here okay now then I want you to do an experiment for me I want you to take some soap powder fold it in the washing machine and uh, fold it in your clothes in the washing machine and I, and I want you to wash your clothes right overload the washing machine with clothes add powder and inspect the results afterwards now then when you're making your pancake batter uh, pancake batter in the kitchen you got to recognize we already talked about this a little bit you add the eggs the powder the oil when you add the powder you're also adding air uh, eggs oil water milk flavoring whatever you're going to produce fish eyes and what happens is you have a, uh, maybe a droplet and around that droplet will be a thick layer of solids right or just a thick layer of solids with very little liquid. Those are called fish eyes. And whenever you spray those, say you were going to uh, put down your pancake, right? You'll see them as lumps on your pancake. And they'll break open as you cook the pancake batter, or cook the pancake. And it's supposed to add flavor. It's supposed to be a good thing, right? But I don't know. Uh, a couple other examples I've run into. Let's get rid of this stuff here. Interesting is, uh, let's go to a slide that has less. Let's go here. Okay, they had a tank and they were making solder paste, right? Solder paste. And they had a fairly good system. They had a helical ribbon. I was impressed that they actually had a helical ribbon helical ribbon and the problem is the solder paste you get a tube of solder here solder paste what would happen is they would have dry packets of lead in here solder paste contains lead lead you heat it up this was uh, supplying solder paste to a car company they were using these tubes to put solder on their circuit boards or on their in their robots to make the connection. They couldn't figure out where these packets of dry lead came from. Okay. So I was walking through the plant talking to the guys there. They were a nice group of people. Anyway, I leaned over the engineer and I says, guess what? See, there was splash up here. Their powder up here, so we'll change the color here. Color and let's go with orange splash up. So they had splash up here, right? And whenever you have add powders, oftentimes you'll find out the uh, li liquid level is there, right? And they were unloading this batch. They're going to unload this batch. So they <clears throat> raised the impeller out of the tank, and they were going to push. The, the dry packet, oh, excuse me, to push the batch out. I guess by a pushing plate. I'm not sure. I don't re recall that much. Anyway, what happened is I said, to, I said to the engineer, wait, watch what will happen. I said, the guy will come along here with a spatula and wipe that down, and then you will have it here. These dry packets up here, it's been a splash up from the mixing operation. What will happen is he'll wipe that down and put it on the center, and then he'll submerge those without breaking them up. He'll submerge those without them breaking them up. So, <laughs> anyway, that, uh, that's, that's the reason why you get dried lead packets here. The, the packets were not well mixed in after the wipe down. The operator had a clean tank, wonderful for him, but he, he caused uh, dry packets of powder, solder stuff in here, which on a circuit board, suppose you had a circuit board, here's your circuit board, you're soldering in a 
circuit. So you're coming in here with your circuit uh, heating element. But previously, uh, previously, one of these dry packets of powder came and wound up right there. So you have this dry packet of powder. And the board, the circuit board, shake been shaking around. It's moving around a lot, and that powder packet broke open and it's no longer there to make a complete seal. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing, interesting item. I will say that uh, this idea of fish eyes, right? Go right in here, fish eyes. That's pow dry powder and, and a liquid, basically, fish eyes. But you can also have water droplets in organic paint. Now, this is an extraordinary story, right? So the extraordinary story requires a fresh screen to work with here. <clears throat> what had happened is you have a spray paint, right? This is a very, very famous spray can of spray paint here. And you would spray spray the paint. And so you'd have this spray going out like that. And it would hit a panel here or a surface. So you're spray painting away. And... <clears throat> drop of water, it's an organic spray paint. A drop of water would suddenly hit the surface. So if I look front on here, I have this really good spray, and then I have a blotch in there because of the water. Now then, why is there water in the organic paint, right? Why is there water droplets in organic paint? So this is what I call the story of 40 consultants, 40 consultants, 40 days and nights locked up in a room. <clears throat> they went through everything, all the theories, they ran tests, everything, and they couldn't find out why there was water droplets in their spray paint. So theory sort of, <clears throat> how can I say it, it sort of ran out on them. So they went, they did some plant tours. So they walked through the plant, didn't find it. So then they decided to go again through the plant. Inside the plant, there was this conveyor belt. And on the conveyor belt, right, it had solids in there, the powder pigment that was going in. So you have the powder pigment that's going into the spray can so you can spray it. <clears throat> Up above this conveyor belt, right, was a steam valve. So you have up here, right above there, was a steam valve, right? And every so often, the steam valve would bubble up some hot water through the packing gland and drip. Every so often, this conveyor belt's moving fast underneath it. And every so often, you'd have this steam valve, bubble, up, bubble over, and put some water in the conveyor belt for the pigment. <laughs> you go ahead and tell me whether science, all your mathematics, and all your uh, theories are going to be able to predict that. Okay. Don't get me wrong here, folks. I'm a great believer in science. I'm also a great believer in engineering. Full guns ahead. But if you're going to do scale up, you got to be aware of scale up being something entirely new. You got to be aware of all kinds of things can happen, and they may not happen the way you think they will be. They will happen. So, especially with solids, solids is a problem phase. So there's three things to scale up that you need to pay attention to. You need to pay attention to the science. That's very important. I agree, science is very important. And engineering, number two, was very, very important. However, number three, luck, serendipity, just by chance, that's out there as well, right? Whether your filter aid is actually a filter hindrance, whether your solids don't form lumps, 
You got bad equipment for the job. You got undefined. Although science works, I think. I think science works. Engineering, I think, works. You have a significant element of uncertainty in everything, everything. So just like the, uh, the reactor that plugged, right? Plugged reactor. Who was going to envision a plugged reactor here? And the premix tank suddenly becomes a bomb. <laughs> so I'm I'm sorry, folks. Uh, you know you got you got to be uh, or temperature change in your storage room. I mean, who could have thought thought that? You know. By the way, that one particular company in Vermont, each batch they were making, they were making they could make a batch a day. That was a hundred thousand dollar mistake. So they made three or four hundred thousand dollar mistakes, and fortunately, uh, they got away with murder. I should have charged them a whole bunch. No, no, just kidding. Anyway, so I went up, gave a lecture on uh, mixing how poorly they were doing in the area. They completely ignored me. I solved their problem, and I went home. Anyway. Fish eyes, fish eyes. I always anticipate fish eyes. Whether it's solids in a liquid or whether it's a liquid in another liquid. Or maybe even air bubbles in a liquid. Anyway, complex solids, process specific. Complex solids, surface chemistry is very important. You find out surface chemistry is important. You also find out agglomeration is important, right? So you find if viscosity can change by orders of magnitude, lots depend upon chemistry, surface chemistry. You have complex solids. You have agglomeration, major factor. So you have this bowl of candies. It's Christmas time, and you have candies sitting in here. You have this hard candy, right? So you're celebrating the New Year's or holidays, <clears throat> December, right? So around February, February eventually comes around, and suddenly uh, these have formed solid bridges between them. So no longer do you have single solids, you have a big, a very big solid, <laughs> right? It used to be you had single solids, single thing, single solids. Anyway, now you have it all agglomerated together, and that's why you surface coat candies, surface coat cookies, is to prevent agglomeration, right? You have this cookie here, and you don't want it to stick to another cookie, so you put a layer of sugar on it, right? Powdered sugar on donuts, powdered sugar on cookies. So prevents agglomeration. Whenever you're dealing with solids, you're going to have problems of agglomeration. Agglomer agglomeration is good, and agglomeration is bad. So there's some examples that are going to cause you problems. One, sticky solids. This is a notorious problem. Crystallization, you may have scalagmites and scalagmites. You have a clinker, clinkers by agglomeration. Uh, the biggest, biggest, uh, biggest uh, agglomerate, I should say, uh, that I've run across is the size of a basketball. A soccer ball is smaller than a basketball. American basketball. Uh, can be quite is fairly large. Anyway, that's the biggest agglomerate I've run across. Fibers are notorious problem. Fish eyes is a notorious problem. Fish eyes, you might uh, this is dry solids in a dilating shell, or it could be water drops in a dilating shell. You might want to try a wire whip to break them up, or heating and vibration, and whatnot. But anyway, mm. sticky solids, avoid these. Sticks to everything. The watering and filtering are expensive. Free incorporation is difficult. Try to do something. Uh, to prevent sticky solids, resuspension is a difficult problem. Contouring of tanks helps. Contouring of the tank helps. 
minimizes impingement points, often used in the paper and pulp and paper industries, sometimes done for complex solids. If you do have sticky solids and you can't live without them, right, you might have a residence chamber to harden or cure them. You might change the temperature. You either go hot or you go cold. I suspect cold will reduce the stickiness, but I don't know for sure. Different solvents, different characters, character stream. You might try changing the chemistry, surface chemistry, poisoning the surface, right? Changing geometry, removing bends and impingement points, we already said. Objective for sticky solids is do not lose agitation, is to not to have a loss of agitation. Anyway, I think I'll stop there, pick this up later, gas liquid contacting. And uh, I hope this is a very important lecture in the fact that you should recognize there's a lot of other things at work and scale up other than uh, in pilot plans, other than science and engineering. Uh, it's, science and engineering are great, but uh, going forward, you should recognize that there are other factors at play than just science and engineering. And I'll stop here. Thank you.